There was a well called Tabernay. They believed held the cure for the sight. Sometimes great changes you never would have wished for lead you to see things in a different light. They say tragedy is purification with pity and terror, but it's not truly great. Does it matter if we fall short of what we wish to be? I had no scar to which to hitch my wagon. I believe in the holiness of the heart's affection. And though I threw up the old man of the sea of Rome, what the human mind can be, natural curiosity. And perhaps it was my Fenian blood that called me home. And I knew one of the most courageous leaders ever. He was humble and larking, Irish through and through. We had nothing to give him of riotous pleasure. As for what a great man he was, I don't think he ever knew. I believe in the holiness of the heart's affection. And though I threw off the old man of the sea of Rome, and what the human mind can be, natural curiosity. Perhaps it was my Fenian blood that called me home. This much I know. Is true in this world that is imperfect and unkind that the truth prevails at last and that we recognize it when we find it. I believe in the holiness of the heart's affection. The human mind can be natural curiosity. Perhaps it was my finger blood that called me home. I believe in the holiness of the heart's affection. And though I threw off the old man of the sea of Rome, what the human Natural curiosity. Perhaps it was my fiend blood that called me home. Called me home. Welcome, everyone to Voxfam Fest 2022. I am Lourdes Perez, and it gives me immense joy to welcome an island sister, singer-songwriter, Susan McKeon from Ireland, a country with such fierce and rich history and music. Susan, uh, we haven't, I haven't had the honor to meet you in person. We have spoken a, a few times, uh, but your songs, your trajectory, your spirit and your human rights work uh, move me deeply. Um, I read a quote from Time Magazine about you that really rings true. This is the kind of music that will link Ireland's musical past with its future. As we speak, you are in your home in Bray, Ireland. Um, Susan, bienvenida, welcome. 
Thank you so much. It's wonderful. It's just great to talk with you again, as always, Lourdes. Um, but what you're doing, being part of this festival, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this amazing work that you continue to do. Uh, el honor es mío, like we say. Uh, it is my feeling that you live and create in, in spaces between worlds, um, between tradition and innovation, between languages, even literally between Ireland and the Lower East Side of New York. Question, what are some of the gifts and the challenges that come with working in those spaces? What a great question. Um, I spoke with a friend last week who lives in Ireland again and lived in Manhattan for many years. And she said, I don't know how you do it. I couldn't live between Dublin and Cork. Uh, but my daughter and I, uh, luckily my daughter, like me, loves Ireland and loves Loisida. And we love to be able to live in both places because they are both very important places we have lived that have played a role in our growth and our healing. And she's very young. She, well, she's 19, but she's lived, had a lot of experiences already. So... Uh, The great thing is we get to see um, uh, experiences from both in both places that are very different in our relationships with people and um, living a life and Loisida and thinking about indigenous culture in Manhattan, which I do all the time now. I'm so grateful for all the people I've known from the you know over three decades I've spent there all the relationships there that have taught me so much about uh, my life in Ireland and the relationships I have there and the healing I uh, work that I wish to do that I try to do here and it comes from uh, looking at indigenous culture in Ireland and how much that informs the work I do with communities so having both is is almost necessary because then um you're working across experiences that can inform um each other so i work literally with communities and then bring information back and we're starting to have those communities talk to each other that are facing the same kinds of problems and also want to heal so whether it's um living with you know gentrification or um communities living in public housing facing chronic underfunding in both places then they can uh, share information and knowledge and uh, expand their own community practice in ways they hadn't thought by uh, by talking to the other communities so that's on the level of the work i do and then in terms of um uh, culture and um creativity and, and music personally for me um, looking at the way artists in both places have uh, uh, you know tried to navigate the incredible challenges of the last 15 years shall we say just to pick a date <laughs> um, whenever Sean Parker started the work that whatever you know the the increasing commodification of culture and social life with technology and technology being neither bad nor good. It's how we use it. And looking at how technology, uh, the owners of the big computers have commodified, um, uh, you know, culture and social life that have created huge challenges and difficulties, immense difficulties for communities. Mm -hmm. And then other ways that, uh, Uh, I'm starting to look at in some of my work that technology can be used to serve communities. And, and so when I think about it, Google can afford to put 12 people in a room for two years and go create something great that we can make money out of. I want to look at ways we can put 12 people in a room for two years to create um, brilliant new technologies that can serve communities. So uh, it's great. It's just such a gift to have to uh, both places um to have a foot in both places i hope that answers sorry what was the question <laughs> i'm kidding i'm kidding <laughs> how do you navigate no it's perfect like it's actually a great answer because those are the, the questions that keep coming up and you put it just so eloquently so thank you yes definitely um your music is 
historic, exquisite, and necessary. Um, it has also been uh, rightfully recognized by your country. You have won a Grammy for your work on the album Wonder Wheel with the Clismatics. What I see is that you move gracefully, uh, making real changes, many times away from the spotlight, then back to the surface to negotiate with circumstances presented to you as if weaving the internal and the external. Uh, how do you keep and nurture that compass that tells you you are on the right track? One question. And is there a particular kind of feedback that you value the most? Wow. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank you for all that you see about what I hope uh, uh, is, is my practice, what I try to do. Um, I think my work is very different now from when it was earlier in, in my life as a songwriter and musician. Um, earlier, I, before I, I think before I became a mother, uh, I had a career um, and I was very fortunate to travel and record. And of course, the, the music, the life making music um, was was so different was so different then with CDs and, you know, the capacity to to tour and make a living was much easier. Mm -hmm. um, so it was so fortunate. Um, and I was guided by, I think, um, I was so fortunate that labels came to me and asked me to make albums of Irish folk song. And I always uh, maintained independence. I didn't want to sign up with one label for a bunch of albums. Uh, but in the end, uh, with one label, Harmonia Mundi, which was a fantastic label, and I was the only Irish artist they ever worked with. I worked with them just album by album, and I brought other people to the label. Mm -hmm. So it was um, so gratifying to be able to perform for audiences, and and they loved um, the work that I was making. So I had some kind of compass then that led me um, in terms of the the traditional songs I would record, I always wanted to do something that would um, that would show a little bit of what you would expect from an Irish folk musician, but a little bit of what you would not expect. So with a mariachi band or with an um, air who player from China, because I heard that sound on this song or, you know, do um, make different uh, soundscapes, but the showing that the language, whether I was singing in Irish or English, if it was traditional lyrics, often I was thinking these were uh, lyrics, you know, um, composed by women orally, maybe not written down to, you know, a generation or many generations after the, the song first came into being. And I was always searching for songs that were forgotten that may, maybe had never been recorded before, that I found in a book or I found one verse on an old acetate. And then I researched and found other verses in a book. So to kind of recreate uh, what was almost lost, because I think I was very, uh, it was only later that I realized that time in our lives when as 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 teens, early teens, maybe people get into to rock music, I, was suddenly, boom, drawn into the voices of women from Ireland who were singing unaccompanied on old recordings. I started becoming interested in that in my early teens. And that was also the time when I didn't know it at the time, but my mother had cancer and was dying. So she had to start taking care of herself and necessarily um, step back a little to take care of herself. So I was losing that voice that I was so close with. She was a musician and songwriter. So I was losing her and then finding comfort in these voices that I now think of as ancestral voices. Yes. So today, uh, through the work that I do, and now, yeah, I've been a mother of a young woman who is 19. It's been an incredible journey. And it's like, uh, there's a Welsh poet, Gwyneth Lewis, who says, um, my writing doesn't come out of my life. My life comes out of my writing. And I love that expression and to think of my work that way. Um, and I do see a much more process in what I do and call and response. Um, and 
uh, fascination with looking back uh, to what the generations before me, um, uh, the lives that they lived and the work that they created. So it it is similar, I guess, in terms of recreation. But the what I'm writing today about is is a little more focused, and I'm more driven to uncover lives. I like writing songs about women who might have might be forgotten unless I write this song. And now people are starting to talk more about some of these women, and um, so that's. There was another part to your question, but that's um, that's one part. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's that's amazing response. Um, the other part of the question is, is there a particular kind of feedback that you value most? Uh, um, I don't know. I don't know the kind of feedback. I, I value my daughter's feedback very much. She's a songwriter too. And we've had this feedback loop going since she was born. <laughs> and I I raised her myself. The two of us grew up together in a way. <laughs> um, uh, she grew up just with me in Manhattan. So we are very close. And uh, yeah, we have a feedback loop going. So I value her feedback very much. And then... Um, I guess sometimes I'm I'm doing work with communities and somebody asked me last week about like the first step I take and and these days the first step that I try to take is to listen. So um if I'm doing work that is part of something like that or writing where I really want to reflect something then um yeah listening to to listening to and researching and trying to learn more about the voice uh, that I'm working with that I want to collaborate with, even if it's an ancestral voice, right. um, is to to be to be quiet and and uh, and try and get that call and response going in the work that I'm and find uh, a guidance in that. I hope that makes sense. And if it doesn't. <laughs> I, I feel I hear you because I feel like silence is such a gift that that is just is is so hard to come by these days. But if you can capture that moment, you know, um, that brings me to the next question of um, the work that you're doing in the Lower East Side of New York. If you can tell us some about that that you've been doing for a long time. Well, uh, I moved there first in 1990. And then I toured and, and was living there all the time, but didn't stop until um, when I had my daughter. Then it's different. You go out on the street and people go, oh, que linda. And you start getting to know more neighbors and um, you have to find resources that you didn't need before. So you start going slowly. And now I love slowly and steadily. Um I guess the work that I do today, uh, my daughter went to the local public school in, um, in, uh, in Lower East Side, uh, on the Lower East Side. And one of the projects I did there in 2009, there were budget cuts. So they were threatening at the arts and language classes. So I made an album for her school and we went around to see all the kind of different cultures that were in the school you know we we're a public school but we were four blocks from the UN school but we were almost more um diverse so it was also the beginning of uh, pop idol and the voice so I thought okay well that's over there let's get back to the internal um what are the voices that are coming from the families of these children so we had 19 different uh, places in the world represented and recorded this album and then we were featured on NPR not even in New York they were doing a fun drive that weekend so it went out on NPR and we raised 30,000 for the school and that budget has been in the black ever since because every time new parents come in they sell them uh, the CD and I thought this is what I want to get at economics and culture because um 
it was bothering me very much that on the Lower East Side, when I landed, there were hundreds of music clubs and now they're all gone, you know, um, and seeing other things, seeing how it impacts and has impacted our brothers and sisters, musicians over the years in terms of economics, but mental health. Yeah. And, um, and then the difference that it makes in the lives of young people today, of young musicians and how challenging it is for young musicians coming out of high school who are as passionate but don't have the opportunities we had when we began our careers. Yes. So I started to um, look for the work I wanted to do that I would love that would have an impact there. And I started Kula Foundation in 2017 after I went back to college to study culture as an economic driver. So on the Lower East Side, we are beginning projects with young people so that they can have creative careers as part of projects that serve the community. And one of the big projects we have, we're waiting to hear is from the New York City Parks Department. Uh, we wrote a um, 60 page uh, document as a proposal in response to a call for proposals for an abandoned building that was the first bathhouse in the city in 1901. So we have one of just a handful of applications to take over that building and turn it into a cultural resource for the community where we can create new ways, new technologies, yeah, but new ways of uh, for young people to have creative careers as part of a community system, a new system. So our mission is um, to uh, co-create new systems of community self-care and then in, in different ways with the community, hand in hand, looking at indigenous knowledge and finding a new way forward. What you're doing is, is great. It's also the, the opening of the possibility of art as, as a way of expression and a way of living and, and a way of, of touching other people and, and just guiding that because like you said, we they don't have the same opportunities or or surroundings that we even had growing up. Yeah, there's so many um, things out there that that are not easy to see and articulate. So I ha I actually have a, a favorite computer scientist, Jaron Lanier, and he's also a musician. And in his book, he's, uh, You Are Not a Gadget, he says young people today have a reduced expectation of what a person is and who they can become. And one thing I think that's missing is history, because when you're living interfacing with an AI or natural language processing, it's feeding you back what you want, what you're putting in. So well, talking about feedback loops, there's less innovation. You're not getting thrown new ideas as, as often as perhaps we used to. So and there's less of a sense of history. But Lowy Side is filled with these with these incredible histories. So now the the young musicians, artists, and uh, people who, you know, just young people who uh, become involved with our work um, are learning more about artists who lived there before them and the history of resistance. And then they can look at the past in order to have a different context for the present and then imagine a new future. And, you know, Jose Marti lived on the Lower East Side oh. and was inspired by a lot of Irish uh, Patriots, emigrants that he knew there at that time. And I only learned this recently uh, that he was very interested in Irish culture. But when I grew up, my grandfather used to play Guantanamera on oh. the accordion. Oh, wow. <laughs> so uh, there's no accidents. No. Um, all of these beautiful, um, you know, uh, intersections of. Yes. Uh, uh, of stories and experiences and histories. Lowy Side is full of people, yeah. people's stories and, and meeting other people and then being inspired by this. So yeah. it's a, it's very exciting work. That's beautiful because we ultimately, we are all connected. Um, and speaking of that connection, I wanted to hear some of the work, the, the solidarity work we are doing with the women of Afghanistan. And that's, well, thank you. That was um, in March of last year. I was in my office on the Lower East Side and I got an email from a young woman, Fatima Kadarian, who is, um, was the captain of the Afghan girls robotics team. 
and she and some of the original team members. Uh, at first, they wrote to me because they wanted to leave Afghanistan. This was in the spring and go and study. Um, they had graduated high school and the Taliban were making it difficult for them in the city where they lived, Herat. So I started looking for opportunities and it's kind of hard to get scholarships for undergrads. Um, but then, uh, of course, we all know the Taliban took over just over a year ago now um, on August 15th. And the girls knew this was coming. So they fled to Pakistan. And I, you know, had never dealt with anything like this before, but I knew some people in the Irish government from my work with the Irish government in New York. So I contacted them and they said, yes, we're starting to hear we're going to have more requests. So they granted special uh, refugee visas immediately to these young women to come to Ireland. So it was amazing that it was like a dream at first. We were like, can this really happen? Because they had to send their passports off um, in Pakistan where they were and they came back and they came to Ireland and we met for the first time when they arrived in Ireland and we went and ate Afghan food, which they were delighted to find in Dublin. And then I had already uh, prepared the way so they could start college the week after they got here. And they've now completed a year of college uh, studying computer science and mechanical engineering. They're not singers, but they're very poetic and eloquent. Um, and it's been an incredible uh, year of work. So necessarily, uh, I just focused on that for most of the months of last year. And uh, they were so fortunate their families were able to get to the United States and are in Los Angeles. So I've been doing a lot of work there, helping the family resettle there. And it's informing a lot of the community work about new ways that we can look at, um, including migrants and refugees. That is, that is amazing work, but what an impact that is going to have in, in the lives of, of so many, many people and women in particular. Well, there is more mm -hmm. we would like to do to help women and girls in Afghanistan today. And that's going to be um, something to look at slowly and steadily to build, to look at the ways we can build opportunities for them, because it must change. It's, it's very interesting because it's alongside the what we do at Voxfam is just try to unearth so many women, creative women from all over the world and occupied territories on earth. And and every time we meet one another, we we grow. We grow and, and we we can exchange and innovate and just 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 simply be in the kindness that, that we know we have, you know, and the historical stance that women have had through through the years and all the contributions that women have made to change, you know, and it's still a big struggle, but we are, you know, we're continuing it. And then not only you work on work of solidarity, but also you have done many uh, musical collaborations. Uh, you have many solo recordings, oral history projects. Tell us what you're brewing up Musically, uh, right now or in the future, what's what's brewing up? Uh, I've got a few pots on the boil mm -hmm. with regard to music projects, and that's uh, now that my daughter's starting on her own career, um, I can uh, get back to figuring out um, what I want to do next in that regard. But I've had a few commissions in recent years, one in Ireland and one in New York. And the one in Ireland, I wrote some songs about women that I discovered who lived in the neighborhood in the 17th and 18th centuries and were like, no one knew who they were. I had never heard of them and they had incredible lives. Um, one of them wrote a book and one of them was a pioneer uh, spectronomer. So she loved... Uh, looking, in fact, that's one of the songs you're going to hear. Um, she loved looking at the stars. Her mother died when she was eight, and her grandfather took her out at night to look at the stars. Yeah. So um, I found it 
uh, just so uh, comforting and, and fascinating to learn about their lives and tell their stories um, using the language of the work that they were passionate about. So I've begun that and now I'm starting to do that for some women in uh, Manhattan as well to unearth their stories and, and tell their stories in a new way. Um, so that's one project. But then I um, made an application to the Arts Council in Ireland to, I'd like to write a memoir. So um, I haven't written a book before. And as you probably know, Lourdes, when you're applying for grants, you usually have to apply for grants doing what you've always done. But because I wanted to do um, something different, I thought, well, I'll try and write a one woman show in a traditional storytelling style because I've gotten grants as a traditional artist with some new songs. Um, and then I'll have uh, worked out some of the things I want to put in the memoir. So I got that grant and now I've been invited to present this one woman show as a stage reading in New York in January. So it's all very exciting and terrifying, <laughs> but they're good, good challenges. And I'm less scared most of the time than I used to be and just uh, excited about the work and uh, new collaborations. And then I have another project I want to do. And I, I was at a writer's retreat last week and met a woman there who is a writer. So we started to talk about maybe collaborating on a, an idea that I've had for a while, but I knew I had to wait for the right you know for the right person to come along and I think that's happened now so everything in its time that's beautiful I, I can't wait to read the book and to hear <laughs> more sorry to write it. your life story is this I, I can't wait um we want to know what's the best way to get your music oh um that's you know I didn't I let my website go for many years and I just got it going again through a good friend, Kelly, um, who designs websites and said, you, you let your website go for so long. So she's uh, put it back online just in the last few months. And that's SusanMcKeown.com. So um, we're gradually building into that, uh, all of the work that I've done in music as well as, as a nonprofit leader. So that um, is a place to learn, but it will be the best place to get the music. And apart from that, I'm on CD Baby. Everything I've done is on CD Baby and, and iTunes. And I uh, produced my own albums, three albums of original song. And they're called uh, Bones, which was in 1995, and Prophecy in 2002, and Belong, which was 10 years ago. That was my last album so far. And then I've made uh, about... Um, 13 other albums, collaborations, and albums of my own, of traditional song that labels came to me and and uh, and had me do with great creative freedom and a couple of great collaborations that I've been involved in. Uh, you mentioned the record with the Klesmatics, and after that, uh, I made an album with Lauren Sklamberg, and he's the singer, the lead singer of the Klesmatics. So we made an, a fun record called Saints and Sadics, which was songs in Irish and English and Yiddish. Um, oh. So that's out there. That's great. Um, anything else that I haven't asked you that you want to say? Anything that comes to mind? That you want um, to oh, just the, the, yeah, at my website, you can see the link to the nonprofit Kula Foundation. And that's C U A L A. So there's, um, we've been very busy with that. I've got a backlog of work to get up on the website, um, but in the fall, sometimes we're, uh, it's a chance to catch up. Um, mm -hmm. But we're doing, yeah, I'm very proud of the work we're doing. So if people want to learn more about that, you can get there by going to my website or just going to coolafoundation.com. And on Boxfam, we'll do a link to your site, and it goes very direct to you, so that loop also will happen. Yes, yes. Also, we'll put the links of your of your organization and all of that, okay? Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Susan Makion, Guru Mahagut. No, I'm No, I'm
<laughs> Thank you for taking the time to be with us today. We treasure you. Um, thank you, thank you. Likewise. Thank you, my sister. Thank you, sister. I'm your host, Lourdes Perez. We are boxfam.org. Please like and subscribe to this program. And all the links are below. Gracias mil. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's lonely. Yeah, then you got it. Yeah. Hi. Up in the dark sky and low, low down in the deep sea. Where you go? And know you're all alone You face your own mortality I was a girl Captivated by stars Exploring the heavens for hours To observe and verify and learn how to name the light. Within my years of the sun, there are numerous stars drifting together through space like a luminous choir. Common velocities, different. special machine to observe the sun's magnetic beams that warp, twist, and burst apart the secrets of the human heart. I looked out on Salt Hill way on out to the sea and consider the earth's gravity and wonder at the universe when your voice no longer says Thank you, Susan. <laughs>